Here again, the solution could come in part from the famous red buses, or at least from this bus in particular. At present, only three of them actually run in the city. At first glance, they don't appear to be any different to the others. But if you take a closer look around the back, what you could mistake for exhaust fumes is nothing more than a plume of water steam. London is in fact one of the European cities that is testing the hydrogen bus on its network within the framework of a European research program. Nine cities uh, were selected to participate uh, in the trial and the, the objectives really were to look at a number of issues such as demonstrating fuel cell buses in everyday service to gain an understanding of how they operate and performance and reliability. Secondly, to trial different methods of hydrogen production and then also look at the effects of temperature, climate and topography on the performance of the fuel cell buses. The one thing that really stands out is how reliable the buses have been. In 2005, the availability, the percentage of availability of the buses was 90%. That means that just for only 10% of the time were the buses not running in service due to problems or faults. And we think that's a really good result for new technologies such as fuel cells. As we've just heard, hydrogen buses use fuel cell technology. In layman's terms, this works a little like a battery in reverse. By applying hydrogen to one pole and the oxygen of the surrounding air to the other, Electricity is generated that is used to feed an engine. At the other end of the fuel cell, the hydrogen and oxygen are recombined to form water. Therefore, zero pollution, especially if upstream, renewable energies are used to produce the hydrogen. And visibly, this is not the only advantage of this clean bus. They're exactly the same as a normal bus, except that it's much smoother and quieter uh, drive. And for similar reasons, the passengers also like them as well. I mean, they're much quieter and smoother. And also the fact that they, they're zero emission. We've had very positive feedback from the public. They fa like the fact that there's no exhaust emissions and they would like to see more of these vehicles in the future. Between now and 2010, London intends to bring 70 hydrogen buses into service on its network. The engineers have until then to solve the problems linked to the autonomy of the buses, as well as the storage and distribution of the hydrogen. Today, to fill up with hydrogen, the three London buses still have to leave the city to reach the only available hydrogen station. It's been built just alongside a conventional petrol station along the motorway. However, this is probably a sign that hydrogen is moving out of the prototype phase and that it has a bright future ahead of it. Parallel to these technological solutions, cities are taking an increasing number of measures to better regulate their traffic. In this field, the mayor of London took a politically courageous decision, as anyone who wants to drive into the heart of the city during the daytime now has to pay for the privilege. Traffic congestion got so bad in London, something had to be done. The congestion charge has been a painful financial penalty for driving into the centre of London. Um, and at the same time, we've massively expanded the bus service. So we were carrying 4 million passengers a day, now we're carrying 6 million. The charge, £8 a day. And don't even think of sneaking in without paying, as you'll be hit by a very heavy fine. At each entrance point of the area, cameras automatically analyze all the registration plates. So, how much money does this charge generate, and what can be done with it? That's the question that we put to the systems manager. About 80% um, of the 122 million went back into improving buses. So, some extra buses were bought, some new bus priority measures were introduced, also, there were a variety of safety measures and some road improvements occurred as a result of that extra money. At the end of the day, the system will without a doubt have led to a more balanced mobility with a greater emphasis on public transport and greater consideration given to less mobile users. Congestion is now down 26% on what it was before charging was introduced. Buses have something like 50% less of of their time spent uh, caught in traffic jams and we've also seen very positive benefits in terms of um, reduced emissions 12 percent down on uh, the emissions which are harmful to our health and a reduction in accidents. Therefore the bet has paid off for the Mayor of London who's clearly proud of his achievement to such an extent that he wants to double the perimeter concern and then turn his sights towards the most polluting vehicles. I'm going to amend the congestion zone in a couple of years' time so that the more polluting vehicles will pay much more. So somebody driving 
a highly polluting vehicle like a sports utility vehicle will pay £25 a day. Now this will be a real pressure on people to um, trade down to less polluting cars. My, my vision in London in 20 years is a city which has cut its carbon emissions by about 25% and I'll feel we have failed if we haven't done that. There is no single solution. At European level, cities are a breeding ground of ideas and experiments that integrate leading-edge technologies and various measures of traffic management or user awareness, for example. Not only does the European Union financially support a large number of such initiatives, but it works with a large number of local authorities to promote the sharing and the spreading of their experiences. That's the aim of the exchange network Civitas, which covers around 100 cities, from Tallinn to Burgos, including Stockholm, Bremen, Krakow or Rome. We rely heavily on this Civitas network because its member cities are a laboratory for new methods, for new means of reducing pollution, of saving energy and of easing traffic flow. Leo, for example, has built park and ride car parks at the strategic points of entry to the city. For only three euros a day, anyone can leave their car in a guarded car park and jump onto the bus that goes around the entire city. To make these car parks even more attractive, users can take advantage of a number of services, such as car washes or collection points for mail order purchases. In Graz, the decision was taken to encourage clean vehicles by handing their owners an Umweltjeton. This translates as environmental token, which grants users preferential rates for the city's parking meters. The heart of the city is the reserve of pedestrians and bikes, and as for the trams and buses, almost all serve the center, most of the time along their own lanes or on priority bus lanes, which means that they cannot be blocked by an articulated lorry making deliveries. They unload in a groupage center outside the city, and the goods are then delivered by smaller vehicles. As we have seen, quality of life and mobility are therefore compatible. And we have the recipe. A good dose of Europe, a measure of local political will, a sprinkling of technology, and a generous helping of acceptance among users.